Today we're going to learn about all the different major phyla of animals on this planet. Remember that kingdom animalia has eukaryotic cells, no cell wall, all multicellular heterotroph and move at some point of their life. Now today we're going to be um, getting a lecture on some of the information that you need to know about the different animal phyla and some of their characteristics. While I'm discussing this, I'm going to have you work on your flashcards. So we're going to be getting about 13 different uh, flashcards for uh, a front and back side that has some of the information that you need to know. While I'm uh, discussing this, you feel free to work on the flashcards and pause and stop and listen to the lecture if you need it. Next class, we have a flashcard only quiz, so make sure you're ready for that. Anything you don't finish up in class is homework. This will be at the beginning of class. You can't use the handout they give you on your flashcard only quiz. I want you to have study material. All right, this is called a cladogram, and a cladogram shows the evolutionary relationships between different organisms going back in time. So this multicellularity here is the precursor or the ancestor of all animals. And this was a very long time ago, hundreds of millions of years ago. The first type of animal we find in the fossil record are the sponges. Then next we find the cnidarians, flatworms, roundworms, mollusks, annelids, arthropods, echinoderms, and lastly in the fossil record we find chordates. Now tomorrow we're going to do some practice with these cladograms, these family trees, but anytime there's a branching point, here, 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 those are the common ancestors to whatever branches from that point. So there's a common ancestor to roundworms and insects at this point. Now this organism is not a roundworm or an insect. It's something that is simpler. Um, and sometimes we have this transitional fossils, sometimes we don't. Every time we discover a new fossil in the fossil record, we can place it somewhere along this um, timeline, and um, it always matches up, whatever we find. We never find chordate fossils in the oldest fossil layers of animals with the sponges. So the other way you read this, again, the branching point is a common ancestor, is everything after these little dots here have this characteristic. For example, multicellularity, everything after this dot, which is all animals, are multicellular. Over here we have tissues. Everything after tissues is an animal with true tissues, or groups of cells with the same function. Sponges, however, do not have true tissues. They have a generalized type of cell that doesn't form tissues. Here we have radial symmetry in the cnidarians, the jellyfish, bilateral symmetry, two sides being mirror images, every other animal, including the echinoderms. As a larva, they have radial uh, bilateral symmetry, but as an adult, they have radial symmetry. There's only two animals on this planet that have radial symmetry, and we'll talk more about what that means later, the cnidarians and the echinoderms. All right, then we have protostomes, so everything after this is protostome up to deuterostome. Coelums, coelums are body cavities, so everything after coelum has a body cavity. These guys here, the roundworms, have a false body cavity. Mollusks, annelids, and arthropods are all protostomes. And here we have deuterostomes, which we'll talk about soon. Deuterostomes include only two phyla, the echinoderms and the chordates, the starfish and the animals with the backbone. There's three major classes under phylum arthropoda. That's crustacea, arachnida, and insecta. And under chordata, we have five major classes, the fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds. This is found on page number um, 747. So open up your book to page 747 and uh, you can copy this into your uh, notes on the front of your page. Let's go ahead and spend about five minutes finishing up our cladogram here and after that we'll move on. Okay, so now I'm going to discuss some of these uh, key terms in context. Now, you've already written down some of the uh, vocabulary, but you should get an explanation of what they mean. In means not. So invertebrates are animals without vertebra or bones surrounding their spinal cord. These are animals without a backbone. The in means not. Most animals are invertebrates or animals without a backbone. And you don't have to write this down. I did it for you. That's in the handout that was picked up yesterday. The only animal uh, phyla that has vertebrates um, are the chordates. And some examples are fish, reptiles, amphibians, and mammals, as well as birds. So at this time, turn to your partner and tell them the difference between invertebrates and vertebrates.
All right, let's look at some more trends that we see to help animals survive and reproduce, especially on land. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about land adaptations as well. All right, animal body tissues and multicellularity. Why multicellular? Well, one cell has to do all the jobs to keep that cell alive. And if you're multicellular, then you can have specialized groups of cells for different functions. For example, uh, we have groups of cells just for movement. Those are their muscle cells. We have groups of cells just for protection. Those are the white blood cells. And then we have groups of cells for conducting nerve impulses. Those are the nerve cells. All those different tissues that make up these cells have different functions that um, keep the whole organism alive. At this time, turn to your partner and explain why being multicellular gives you an advantage. Think about if you were a single-celled organism, how would you get across the classroom? With groups of cells, muscle cells, you can move across the classroom much faster. All right, this is in your handout, and uh, you do need to know this, and you do have to memorize it as well. Cells make up tissues, and tissues make up organs. Organs will make up organ systems, like the digestive system, and then the organ systems make up the whole organism. Tissues are a group of cells with a common structure and function, and groups of tissues makes up organs. So for example, we got nervous tissue, that's part of your stomach, which is an organ. Tissues make up organs. We have connective tissue holding things together. We have smooth muscle uh, tissue that causes the stomach to churn when you're hungry. We have blood, which is a connective tissue, connects the lungs and other parts of your body to uh, any other organ. And then we have epithelium, which is a covering, and we have coverings on the inside and outside of our stomach. So those tissues make up the organ known as the stomach. All right, body symmetry. There's only one animal on this planet that has no symmetry at all, and that's phylum periphera, the sponges. So that one's an easy one to remember. There's only one no symmetry, and there's no, symmetry means that one part is like a mirror image of the other part, and there's no part here that's a mirror image of any other part. Radial symmetry means that at a center point, you can cut through that center point, and every slice will be equal to the size. Think about like cutting a pizza through the center. That would be an example of like radial symmetry. And there's only one animal with true radial symmetry, and those are the jellyfish, the cnidarians. The only other animal that has radial symmetry are the starfish, but as a larva, they have bilateral symmetry. They only gain that radial symmetry as an adult. Most animals have something called bilateral symmetry, where one side is a mirror image of the other side. Here we have a, uh, some kind of insect, and the one side of the insect is a mirror image of the other side, and that's called bilateral. We have bilateral symmetry. Turn to your partner and explain bilateral, radial, and no symmetry. All right, animal circulatory systems. What do you need to circulate as an animal? Multicellular organisms need to be able to get oxygen and glucose and amino acids and other stuff to every cell of their body. And that's what the circulatory system does, delivers that stuff to every cell of the body. Also, animals have to get rid of metabolic waste from cell metabolism. Things like urea and ammonia will be real problems for the living uh, organism. And if they build up in the body, it could be a toxic situation. So you have an excretory system that will get rid of it from the blood. Turn to your partner and explain why we need to have a circulatory system. Simple diffusion. Now, if it's a simple animal like the uh, jellyfish, the cnidarians, they don't have a circulatory system. They just have simple diffusion. They break down their prey. This is not a bird. This is a Daphnia, a small animal. And um, once it's broken down, the materials only have to diffuse, go from high to low concentration, to cell layer thickness. So there's no advantage to having a circulatory system if your cells are right there next to the food you eat. Now, most animals don't have a gastrovascular cavity. They have a more complicated system of pumps and tubes. Remember, in plants, the tubes were xylem and phloem. In animals, there'll be arteries, veins, and capillaries. Now, there's two types of circulatory systems that we have. We have open versus closed. In an open circulatory system, the blood does not stay in the blood vessels. It actually leaves the blood vessels. And this is true of things like insects. The fluid, or the blood, of an insect is not different from the fluid that surrounds all of its organs. That's, that's different from us. Our red blood cells stay inside of our tubes, our arteries and veins, and when they leave, of course, then we bleed. 
Now, bugs have a different color to their um, blood. It's like a greenish blue color. That's because they use a different uh, protein other than hemoglobin and us that makes our blood red. Their blood is green because of something called hemocyanin, which is a, a different oxygen carrying molecule. Now, the big thing that you should know here is an open circulatory system is not as efficient as a closed circulatory system. Once the blood carrying all the good stuff like glucose and amino acids leaves the tubes, then you have to rely on diffusion, which takes a long time over long distances, which kind of limits the size of these bugs. It's one reason why bugs don't grow to the size of houses. If they did, you'd have to rely on diffusion once the blood left those tubes to deliver stuff to all the cells of the body, and uh, that would take too long to keep that thing going. In fact, even those prehistoric uh, insects like the dragonflies probably were fairly slow because of the limitations of an open circulatory system in delivering stuff to all the cells of the body. Now, a closed circulatory system is a little bit more uh, advantageous. We can deliver those glucose molecules and red blood cells with the oxygen right up to the cells of the body. It's a more efficient system. And the simplest animal to have that are the earthworms, not the other worms, not the roundworms or the flatworms, just the annelids or phylum annelida. Here we have some uh, different types of hearts that I'm going to talk about now. The fish have a two-chambered heart. They have one atrium and one ventricle. And this one ventricle that does all the pumping has to pump to all the cells of the body and to the gills of the fish. You do have to know that the fish have a two-chambered heart. Don't worry about writing this down or anything. We're going to review this tomorrow. Amphibians have a three-chambered heart, like reptiles, and there's some problems with it. There's mixing of blood between the chambers of the heart, which means oxygen-poor blood, represented by blue, mixes with oxygen-rich blood, which means that they're not delivering just good oxygen-rich blood to all the cells of the body. Now, birds and mammals have a more complicated heart. We have a four-chambered heart. We have complete separation of the oxygen-poor blood from the oxygen-rich blood. We have one circuit that takes oxygen-rich blood to all the body cells, and then we have another circuit, another loop here, that takes the oxygen-poor blood, represented by blue, to the, um, to the lungs. Now, blood is not actually blue. Blood is like a purplish-red color when it's oxygen-poor and a bright red color when it's, uh, when it's oxygen-rich. They just color it in blue on these pictures to make it easier to tell the difference. But some people have that uh, misunderstanding. Also, the blood looks a little bit blue if you look at your skin, but your skin is um, causing it to look blue. If the blood was not being affected by the color of the skin, if it was you know, out of the tubes, then it would look purplish red if it was in a vein. All right, turn to your partner and explain the advantages of a closed circulatory system versus an open circulatory system. All right, animal respiration, gas exchange. Why are we exchanging gases? Well, we have to get oxygen for cell respiration, and we have to get rid of carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of cell respiration. Turn to your partner and explain why animals respire. All right, so we have some gas exchange in many forms. Here we have a one-celled organism. They just rely on simple diffusion, high to low concentration. Amphibians are interesting because they can breathe through their skin. Uh, as a result, however, they have very thin skin, which doesn't offer them much protection. Also, oxygen only dissolves in water, so it also always has to be moist. When that frog or newt dries out, it won't be able to breathe through its skin anymore, and that could be a life-threatening situation for that frog. The blood vessels just take in oxygen directly by um, diffusion, get rid of carbon dioxide. So that's why those little frogs and newts can live under the water without seeming to uh, need to breathe. They're just breathing through their skin. Echinoderms, which are the starfish, breathe through those little bumps called papula. You don't have to know that. Uh, insects breathe through, these, breathe through these holes in their side called spiracles. They don't breathe through their mouth. They only eat through their mouth, unlike us. Fish have gills, which just have lots of little blood vessels for exchange of gases. And then mammals have these little sacs within our lungs called alveoli for gas exchange from high to low concentration. All right, let's look at insects a little bit. Now, if you ever see a movie where the bugs are talking, they wouldn't be able to talk through their mouth. There's no gas exchange through their mouth. They're exchanging gas through the gases through the holes in the side of their body called spiracles. So there are the spiracles, and these are the ways that uh, bugs breathe not through the open circulatory system. Here we go. When we have those Madagascar hissing roaches, uh, when they hiss, they're hissing through the holes in their side. They're not hissing through their mouth. All right, here's some uh, information about uh, the types of uh, respiratory surfaces found in different animals. If you're an aquatic organism, you don't have to worry about drying out. So you have an outside or external system exposed to the external environment. If those fish gills ever get dry, they won't be able to uh, exchange gases anymore 
But since they live in the water, that's not really a problem, is it? So aquatic organisms, there's no survival uh, value, uh, selective pressure for internal respiratory surfaces because you live in the water. Terrestrial or land surfaces are a little bit different. We have internal gas exchange surfaces on the inside of our body prevent from drying out. That's why your lungs are on the inside and the gills uh, of a fish are on the outside. We're a land animal, so we have to keep those respiratory surfaces moist on the inside of our body. If they were on the outside, they would dry out and we would suffocate. All right, let's pause at this point and explain the differences in respiration between animals, um, amphibians, insects, fish, and mammals. Look at the handout if you need to.